Hi there everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student and welcome back to my interview preparation series. In a similar vein to what we've discussed before here on the channel, sometimes it's the case that you'll be asked to discuss a medical book that you've read. And that's a bit tricky because it's not 100% clear what they're getting at. What they've asked you is clear. They've said, tell me about the book. So you need to tell them about the book, but what are you going to tell them about the book? However, I think that we can apply some logical thinking to this problem and we can at least work out what they probably don't want and work back from there, which would be a start. I was actually really concerned about coming off a bit cliche uh, when it came to thinking about medical books because I'd read the same medical books that every other candidate applying had, whether that was Do No Harm, The Checklist Manifesto, Your Life in My Hands, Fragile Lives, the Emperor of All Maladies, there's a list of like 20 books. Just anything by Atul Gawande or Adam Kay, right? Everyone has read more or less the same book. And that's not necessarily a problem, but it does give us a piece of valuable information, and that is that most candidates are going to have read the same books, which means that the interviewers are likely to hear similar things over and over again. So with that in mind, what ultimately is probably going to matter here is that they have a reasonable expectation as to what the answer is going to be, which book we have read, but what's going to differentiate us is the analysis that we can perform, the higher level thinking, what lessons can we take away and apply to our own future practice as doctors. And that's actually really important because by and large, most of these medical bestsellers are not works of fiction. They are autobiographical. That's why they're really exciting and that's why they're bestsellers. The reason that all medical candidates have read the same handful of books is that they give a decent insight as to what it's actually like to work as a doctor within the NHS in the 21st century. And plebs like you and me, desperate for a place at medical school and to become doctors, we lap up that stuff. But when it comes to interviews, we need to use that, seize that opportunity to take away those key elements and messages that are going to be relevant for the career that we're letting ourselves in for. That's why they often recommend reading books like this, and that's why they're going to ask us about them. Now, I'm sure by now you're wondering what my answer to this would be, and I'd read the same, as I say, handful that everyone else had, but I was prepared to talk about one at my interview, and that was this one. Maybe surprising no one. Do No Harm, Stories of Life, Death and Brain Surgery, by Mr. Henry Marsh, who I've now had actually the good fortune to meet twice. And hopefully, yep, you can see here, this copy is signed by the man himself. Hopefully you can make that out. What is this book? At its most basic, it's a story about neurosurgery and what it's like to be a specialist in a very niche medical field and a surgical specialist at that. So he's a very particular type of doctor dealing with a very particular type of problem in a very particular way by doing brain surgery. And so now we're thinking about what is life like as a specialist surgeon, as a registrar, a junior, a consultant. He describes the many, many years of training, the nights on call, the trauma cases where he was suddenly called to the hospital without any notice, the extreme nature of the problems that neurosurgeons often have to deal with, how invasive the procedures are, and the consequences both for patients and the doctors operating when things go wrong because neurosurgery, because it's so invasive, things go wrong. There's vignettes about what it's like to be a surgeon, to work as part of the surgical team, working with the nurses and other members of the team, and even what it's like getting involved with legal problems as a doctor and how these cases normally go. And I quite like those insights. Even if you had no interest in surgery whatsoever, this book could still tell you quite a lot about what being an NHS doctor is like. And moving away from the medical focus quite briefly, what's nice about this book and what makes it such a groundbreaking book, particularly among neurosurgeons, is that he talks extensively about his personal life. Most of the instances in which he talks about his personal life are actually quite negative. He became immensely self-important and obsessed to a degree with his work. That eventually led to the breakdown of his marriage. He had a struggling relationship with his children. And there are clearly quite long periods of time where he just doesn't have any semblance of a real life other than his work. And even by his own accounts, he comes across throughout large parts of the book as being 
really quite difficult to work with, not necessarily the most pleasant colleague. He gets very frustrated with his trainees, micromanaging them, and he does describe one instance quite candidly where he physically assaults another member of the team. That would absolutely never be tolerated if it happened today. That, that doctor would be gone. So, so why am I actually talking about this book? What can we start to pull from this? What higher level thinking can we do? Well, bearing in mind, obviously, that he wrote the book, it's not a biography. He comes across as immensely competent, and I think his track record speaks for that. And that's balanced somewhat by the fact that he speaks very candidly and openly about the mistakes he's made and the consequences that has for his patients. That's why this was such a big deal among neurosurgeons, particularly in places like America, where they could never admit to these kinds of mistakes. But he actually broke with a lot of traditional medical culture in putting this out there. And the duty of candor has become much more important for doctors in the last sort of 20 years. If a doctor makes any mistake at all when treating a patient, they have to apologize to the patient, tell them what's happened and document it to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Would I want him to be my doctor? Um, yeah, he seems to have good rapport with his patients. They seem to have an immense amount of faith in him. And that's sort of demonstrated by the fact that he attempts these very challenging surgeries and the patients agree to them. But on the other side, he demonstrates some, some serious personality flaws, some anger problems. And he doesn't seem to always work that well with his team. Would I want to be his trainee and he my consultant? maybe less inclined. So he is by no means a perfect doctor. And if you can read your medical book and ask these types of questions, you know, what are they like as a doctor? Are they competent? Do they make mistakes? Do they admit to their mistakes? What's their relationship with their patients like? What's their relationship with their colleagues like? How do you think this might impact the care that patients receive and how well the team works? Those are the types of questions that I'd encourage you to ask and consider when you're reading your medical books. And perhaps most crucially, in areas where there are shortcomings, you know, someone is always late or they don't know what they're doing or they act without thinking, how are you gonna make sure that these problems don't apply to you? So I prepared a little passage here if I was gonna try and summarize this. So I read Do No Harm by Mr. Henry Marsh, who is a consultant neurosurgeon reaching the end of his career. It's an autobiography where he talks about his life as a brain surgeon, the types of operations he does and the types of patients that he treats. Throughout the book, he demonstrates that he's really committed to his patients and they seem to really have a lot of faith in him, which is something that I admire. I would want my patients to have a lot of faith in me. He achieves that by taking the time to discuss everything with them fully, making sure to address any of their concerns and having a... He does this by giving them the time they need to discuss things properly and answering their questions honestly, even if he doesn't know how operations are going to go. However, it does appear that he can also be quite difficult to work with. He's very demanding, doesn't always trust his colleagues. So if I were ever to become a neurosurgeon or a surgeon or a doctor more generally, I would need to make sure to treat my colleagues with respect whenever I interact with them. I need to develop trust in the rest of my team and have everyone act to the best of their ability and not try and micromanage them all the time because a good leader empowers their team to succeed, doesn't take on all the work themselves. And ultimately remember that if our team doesn't work well together, then it's the patient that pays the price for that. So that would be just an example of the sort of spiel that I would give were I to talk about this in an interview. I hope you found that useful, guys. Please let me know in the comments what medical books you've been reading. Ask these questions. I'd be really interested to know what you've been thinking about with regards to your own medical interviews. Let me know your favorites in the comments. And that's where we're gonna wrap this video. Thanks very much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out olliburton.com for more free interview prep videos just like this. Take care and I'll see you next time.